And I've never been the same since Jesus saved me. But now I have the power of God within. And day by day I know my life is changing. I'm so glad that I've been, I've never been the same. And I've never been the same since Jesus saved me. so glad that I've been born again. Thank you for coming out to Sunday School this morning. We're going to continue our series with Pastor Greg on Memorial Stones. There's Sunday School for all ages, also Spanish-speaking Sunday School. And we'll open in prayer. Father, we thank you for all that you're going to do today. We give you all the praise in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning. And we are going to finish out our series on memorial stones is the last lesson got a lot to get through so listen quickly let's begin uh, today's lesson first issue i want to talk about is the preparation for succession i am telling you in all of this series of uh, our church and uh, the founder of our fellowship my father wayman mitchell he had led us from 1970 and on. And so a wise leader prepares for the future. A wise leader is preparing for the day when he will be gone. And so in order to prepare, a wise leader has to develop a successor, someone who will continue the work once they're gone. Years ago, I had someone ask me, what will I do one day when Pastor Mitchell's gone and he has chosen a successor, and the nature of the question is, of course, because of my relationship with my father, how would I handle when he chose uh, a successor? And my answer was, I will assume that just like Pastor Mitchell heard from God and had wisdom in everything else, that he heard from God and used wisdom in uh, choosing a successor, and I will get behind that choice, of course, I had no idea at the time that that would be me. I assumed that would be somebody else. Lisa and I went to South Africa in 1997. And uh, I told the last, uh, last lesson, God supernaturally helped us to establish a church there, became a conference center. We built a building, we planted churches God helped us wonderfully. 2004, we hit the seven-year mark of being uh, in South Africa, and I began to feel unsettled, restless. We loved it in South Africa. I, I was not dissatisfied in any way. I had felt this feeling before. I knew that God was preparing us to move on and do something else. I had no direction for that. Talk to Lisa. She agreed Felt the same, and so in the absence of uh, direction, we had been seven years in South Africa. We had spent two years before that in Australia, so we had been nine years away from America, and so we decided it would be best to return to the United States with no direction, just using logic. We only had one church in Miami, Florida at that time, so. Lisa and I just kind of roughly agreed, let's go pioneer in Miami, Florida. Right after uh, making that decision between ourselves, Robert Polacco, one of the other missionaries, he asked me to go with him to a, a mechanic that was near my house. I went with him. This is a uh, man is a total non-Christian, chain smoking. Uh, he hears our accent and asked us while he's looking at the car, what are you doing here? And we told him we're, we're preachers. We're here to tell people about Jesus, help people build a work for God. And the man looked directly at me. I don't know if he pointed with his cigarette, but he looked at me and he said, you should be in Turkey. 
you should go to the nation of Jerusalem. He didn't say it to Robert. He wasn't talking like in general, they need. No, he said to me, you need to go to Turkey. Robert laughed, like, ah, yeah, Greg, you need to go to Turkey. Like, that was a great joke. I thought, that, that was weird that that guy did that. When I got home, I told Lee, you're not going to believe what happened. And the guy looked right at me, and he said, you, you should be in Turkey. And Lisa's eyes got wide. She said, Greg, this morning when I was praying, God spoke to me and said, we need to go to Turkey. And I said, no. I had no interest in, we'd already been nine years overseas. Uh, I, it was never, it ever occurred to me, and I just said, no. So I thought, I'm going to call dad. I'm going to call my pastor. I'm going to tell him, I said, you know, this mechanic, that happened. And then Lisa said, and what I was expecting him to say was, don't be stupid. You've already been overseas nine years. It's time to come home. That's not what he said. Instead, he said, could be God. You should go check it out. And I was like, no, that's the wrong answer. And I, I struggled. I want to tell you, I did not want to do this. I dutifully booked a ticket to go and scout the land in, uh, in Turkey to go to numbers of, of cities and look around for the prospects of Pioneering, I still remember to this day flying on British Airways from Johannesburg to Istanbul, Turkey. I was wrestling with this, but I had made a deal years before, God, I'll do anything you want me to do. And on that plane, I just made my seat an altar and I prayed and said, God, I do not want to go to Turkey, but clearly you're doing something. If you want me to go to Turkey, Lisa and I, I surrender, we will go. Landed, looked around Istanbul, met a number of people, went to Ankara and a few different places. Near the end of that trip in scouting, I felt God speak to me, this is not for you. It could have saved a lot of money and time if you'd have told me that back in Johannesburg. I thought that, that was really weird. Why would God do that supernaturally to get me here? Don't know. Went back, flew back to Johannesburg. It was only weeks, maybe a month later. It was conference. Dad came to conference. So one morning, he said he wanted to talk to me. Went in the office, and he spoke to me about the future. At that time, he said, I'm 75 years old, and it's time to prepare for my succession. And uh, he told me what was needed in, uh, in being a leader. He explained why some men, some leaders would not be suitable. For instance, he felt uh, having someone who had no connection with Prescott, that would probably uh, not uh, work well. And then he stunned me. He said, I've prayed about it, and I want you to succeed me. And uh, he said he had heard from God. But apart from that, he using holy logic, he explained his reasoning. This wasn't pulled out of the air or simply because I was related. He explained experience. I have done literally everything you can do in ministry in our fellowship. I started as a, a concert director on staff. I have pioneered churches. Uh, we've taken churches. I have evangelized. Uh, missionary experience, Dad felt was crucial because we have such a huge uh, missions involvement. We had spent years, seven years in South Africa, five years or so in Australia in ministry outside of America. Uh, he felt that was important. He said, a major factor is my wife, Lisa. He said, Lisa is ideal as a, as a leader's wife because she doesn't fight with people. And uh, she knows how to keep her mouth shut. We never have to clean up problems that Lisa has created. And he said that is a major uh, factor in that. So he said, I, I want you to come to Prescott, be on staff. And uh, in, in his mind, he said it will take five years before people accept you as the leader. That was wildly optimistic. But nonetheless, I... I you know, I, 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 I'm trying to describe to you how stunned I was at this. And I said, okay, 
I trust you, you're, you hear from God on a level I do not, so, but I said, you know, you have changed your mind before, of course, I've explained in this series, there were other men that he put in place here, it didn't work out, I said, look, at any time, if you ever change your mind, no problem, you tell me, Lisa, and I'll go do something else, no, no hard feelings, but okay, we'll, we'll do it, I went home and told Lisa, we talked about this and we said, the essence is my parents need help. They need, dad's 75, mom was uh, 71 probably at that time. And so he said, we will go serve the Prescott Church. We will serve them. I didn't actually believe that be, taking over would come to pass. I thought at some point dad would say, on reflection, we found somebody better. But uh, nonetheless, we said, we're going to do our best, and we did that. We came here in November of 2004. We served my mother in her capacity, not only in life, but in her roles in the church until she passed in 2016. We served my father until his dying breath in, in uh, uh, 2020. But being on staff, November of 2004, from that time, Dad began to prepare me. He talked over every decision. He talked over every crisis that came up in time because he wanted me to know how he thought, not just what he did, why did he do it? So he explained in great detail how he approached things. He talked over decisions that he was making. He talked about people, conflicts, and all kinds of things. At times, he would test me. He would ask me, what do you think uh, that I should do? These are in things that are beyond my experience. He wanted to know if I was thinking like him. Was I approaching it like him? Uh, there were times he put very difficult, disciplined decisions on me, made me handle it for the purpose of uh, character development and testing me in that way, involved me in conflict meetings. In leadership, sometimes you have conflict meetings. Uh, I got to see how he handled those. He involved me in international uh, church planting meetings in, in the decision of why are we going to send a worker and where and all the, he involved me in all of that. I asked lots and lots of questions. That's how you learn. I asked about the past. I asked how do you approach uh, this. I asked what he saw in the future. And then, of course, Dad, as a wise leader, he gave me exposure, wide exposure. Uh, I began preaching permanently on, on a nighttime slot, Wednesday night of conference. I probably started doing that in 2006 or seven, from my record, probably 2006. Clearly there were other men that were better preachers. Dad was, number one, letting me develop in preaching, but number two, he was sending a message, and he wisely did that. If by the time I took over, if anyone was surprised by that, uh, you probably didn't do very well in school either. You, you probably missed some things because he was clearly sending a message. So that is preparation for Succession. Let's talk secondly about the Australian Rebellion. It's fitting in this final lesson that we talk about Australia again, so um, central to my father's ministry and, of course, my life and ministry as well. In, I'm thinking 1998, a man took over the church in Perth, West Australia that we originally planted in 1978. Now it's located in a place called Beachboro. That's just a suburb of Perth. This man then became the leader of all Australian works in Australia and internationally. They have a wide uh, number of works all around the world. But this was a problem because he immediately began to shift the church in unhealthy ways. One of the things he did was that he shifted the emphasis of the church to money because that was his heart. I was with him one day and he told me out of the blue, I mean, made this statement, you know, I'm basically a millionaire. I'm like, I wasn't asking that. And I don't know if you are aware, that's probably not, that's rude. 
just be telling people, but what does the Bible say? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That was what he loved, was money, investment properties, and that's what he talked. And so he began to put that spirit in the church. This was a, something very noticeable to Lisa and I. Remember, that's our home church. This is where we were trained. That's where we were sent out from. The church in Perth, now to come, we have family and friends in the church, or we come back for a visit, and to see when we left, it was evangelism, discipleship, doing the will of God, and now you come back and people are talking about money, investment, properties, and, and uh, whatever. This man proselyted in a large group of people from another church. They were Romanian Pentecostals. Uh, already existing Christians, a large group of them. He uh, proselyted in. They were not like us, but they were numbers, which were important to him. He actively would pull on people from other fellowship churches to get them to move there. What happens in leadership is you get people, they contact leaders because there is a conflict with their pastor. There's a problem. They don't understand something. They don't like something. So they call, and it's the job of a leader. What you want to do, ideally, is to fix that problem so they stay in the church. That is not what happened at all. Anybody who called with a problem in your church, very soon they would wind up moving to Perth because he was actively, he had a way of, uh, getting these people to, to think that the best plan for their life. And so what was happening, the numbers are growing, but they're do proselytes and transplants. It's not conversion. Church planting slowed. Uh, he was planting other people's men. There would be people announced at conference, but they weren't his men. He was planting other people's men. And uh, so while things are changing, Pastor Mitchell was very gracious to this man. He believed the best. My father was not fooled. He knew that there were problems in his spirit. But dad was believing for the best. He was praying and hoping that this man would come around and start doing right. And one day in a conversation with Joe Campbell, telling you know, Joe Campbell seeing the problems and, you know, Pastor, this guy is not doing right. And Dad said, I know, but I'm working with him and whatever. Joe Campbell made an all-time classic statement. I'll put it on the screen. He said, the problem, Pastor Mitchell, is that it's just not in him. And that described this man classically. You know, there are people, you can have problems, but if basically the heart of our fellowship and the will of God is in there, you can correct problems. Joe Campbell said, but it's not in him. Working with somebody, if it's not in there, you're not going to fix that. And that was, a, that was prophetic, very, very classic. This man was rebellious. He began to speak against Pastor Mitchell, which is what rebels do. They always drop seeds of rebellion. He spoke against the fellowship and what he was trying to do is in Australia and the churches in the UK and under his uh, area of ministry, he was trying to turn them away from the fellowship. He and his wife lied. Oh my goodness, they lied. Remember the lesson I've repeated several times, rebels lie. And this is on... This is on a steroid level of life. This is 2023 when I'm telling you. This year, it's been 14, 15 years since the man was gone. This year, on a number of occasions, just a few weeks ago, I still, to this day, have people tell me lies that he said. Like incredibly, lies about Pastor Mitchell that were not true, about uh, American leaders in general, or, or even about me and... Uh, uh, the idea of, of doing that was he was trying to put American leadership in a bad light. And he was using a strategy of rebellion that often people in other nations use. He was using nationalism. 
people who love their country, they naturally are protective of their country, right? So he was using nationalism. He would drop these seeds, and a, and a mantra that he would repeat was, we have to protect Australia against the day that Pastor Mitchell is gone. Because when Pastor Mitchell is gone, oh, it's all going to go to hell. It's going to get bad. So he was, so we have to protect, it's for the Aussies. We've got to protect against the day Pastor Mitchell is gone. There were numbers of conversations that were had with this man by Pastor Mitchell, other leaders. There were numbers of meetings that were held. There were numbers of confrontations that took place. It was, it became very clear this man was heading for rebellion. This was going to end ugly. The point in when a rebel lies, the point when a rebel seeds and tries to turn people, it's because they're planning on leaving. And that became absolutely clear. But, but here's the problem, is that you have to, while trying to protect, you have to protect people at the same time. So even though everything within you may want to tell people, listen, he's a dirty dog rebel, you can't do that because you have to have people survive spiritually. If you just come in and say, this guy's a devil, you make everybody suspicious of everything they're doing. The problem is, if he's ever gone, they will just transfer that suspicion to the new guy. So this is a balance. Lisa and I, it was a struggle because we had family. We had to bite our tongue. We never bad-mouthed and, and uh, openly told family or friends what we actually thought because we were trying to preserve their salvation, and that's what Pastor Mitchell did uh, as well. We reached a tipping point in Australia where it became clear something had to be done. Daryl Elliott came into the church. Uh, he was actually from Geraldton originally. He had been a, a missionary for a number of years in New Zealand, so now he came into the church, and he realized that something was wrong he realized the same thing that I had told Pastor Mitchell when I would go for family visits and would see the church in a regular service now. I said, he, he came to this conclusion. The problem is it's very different than it is at conference. Conference, you have everybody there, it's excitement. It's like, woo, we're doing the will of God, but then it's in the regular services. And he said, no, something is changing. It's very unhealthy. Daryl came to, uh, I can't remember if it was when Pastor Mitchell came there for a conference or he came here. He asked Pastor Mitchell, he finally became so troubled, he asked Pastor Mitchell, is this man who is the leader, is he in right relationship with you? And again, my father was gracious, trying to protect him, preserve. He did not openly just said, nope, he's a dirty dog rebel, but uh, Daryl, understood this man is not in right relationship with Pastor Mitchell, so we're in trouble. He began to see that what the man was doing was wrong, and he personally made a decision for our children and for future generations, I am going to have to make a stand. This man called Daryl one day. Daryl would have been one of the older pastors, was uh, so attended leadership meetings there in Australia. The man who was a leader called one day, he was mad at another leader and was rallying. He wanted to terminate him. He wanted to remove him. And so he was calling Daryl to get his support so that he could kill the other guy. And Daryl asked him a question. He said, do you mind if I call Pastor Mitchell and ask his opinion? There was silence and the man said, well, that depends on what you're going to tell him. And so, but it became clear that for him to call his pastor, the leader's pastor, Pastor Mitchell, to ask for his advice, that would not be perceived well. But Daryl called. Pastor Mitchell happened to be out of town, so he wound up, uh, got a hold of me. I was the one, got the message, and I called him back. He asked very direct questions, and so now... He was explaining what was troubling him, the things that were happening, and I then began to explain the full perspective of all that had been going on. 
and uh, in there. And so uh, he wound up having a conversation with this leader and told him directly that he felt he was wrong, not in right relationship. The moment he did that, he began to be targeted uh, by him. Very interesting, in the July 2008 conference here in Prescott, you know, the leaders pray for, when my dad was alive, they prayed for him as the leader of the fellowship every time. That would be the final act of the conference. July of 2008, Pastor Paul Stevens, one of our leaders in our fellowship, Board of Elders member, gave Pastor Mitchell a word and he said, on an international level, in the next six months, God is going to sort out some problems that have been troubling you. That was a powerful word. I want you to see, I'm showing you pictures from my dad's Bible. I want you to show you, there's a fascinating uh, picture. I want you to see here that uh, verse 18, which is underlined, let the lying lips be put to silence, which speak grievous things proudly and contemptuously against the righteous. He put this man's name, Vickery. That is the man's name, David Vickery. August of 2008, I want you to look down at the bottom. The Lord preserves the faithful and plentifully rewarded the proud doer. Look at what my dad wrote. This is now a prayer that he wrote in August of 2008. Let me see it, Lord, this year. Fascinating. Pastor Stephen said in six months, within six months, it's going to be sorted out. That was, my dad grieved for Australia. He loved the Perth Church, loved Australia and the works. And he said, Lord, sorting out lying lips and preserving the faithful and reward the proud doer. He said, oh, Lord, let that happen this year. Some leaders uh, came and met with dad. We had the men's rally at the, one of the high schools in Phoenix at that time. Numbers of us, there was probably five or six leaders, we met with dad in December of 2008 to discuss all that was, it was boiling very heavily. It was clearly headed for rebellion. And the advice of all of the leaders was, Pastor Mitchell, you need to remove that man. If you don't, he's going he's gonna to take all of these churches out of the fellowship. They said, remove him. And dad's initial response was, no, if I reach in and remove him, it'll make him a martyr. He'll use that, the sympathy, which was what he was using, emotional manipulation. He said, it'll make it worse. I don't feel that's right. And then they said, what if he was to resign or, you know, various situations. And they told him the words, look on the screen. Every leader said, Pastor Mitchell, the only one who can go and take the church is you. Okay, it's, if we send anybody else, the, our words we used was, Pastor, it's going to be a bloodbath. Now, I'm the only one who has citizenship. I have dual. I'm an American and an Australian citizen. citizen. I, I could have gone, but I said, number one, who's going to help dad? But more than that, even if I go, it will not, it'll be, a, it'll be worse. It'll be a bloodbath. That man has spent years lying, seeding. No. And we said, dad, you need to go. And this is what dad said. He said, I am 80 years old. Nelda is 75. He said, I don't think I can do it. I just can't. At age 80, going in, knowing it's going to be a fight, that was it. It was a, I want to tell you, it was a, for these guys, they can see in the big picture, but it's very personal. This is, this is our family. These are our friends. This is our church. But that was dad said, I don't think I can do it. The board of elders summoned this man. Basically, a summons means we ordered him to come to conference in January of 2009 for a board of elders meeting. We are going to settle this once and for all. And so knowing that this man began to make moves, really he didn't want to come and sort it out. He wanted to leave. And so he was working on his counsel. He spoke to a man named Don Rowlandson. I name him, God bless you, Don. May God bless you, your children, your cats, I don't, everything. <laughs> the blessing of God be on you. 
because Don Rawlinson began to be troubled by this man and finally had begun to ask questions and had gotten uh, information from Pastor Mitchell on the full perspective. One morning after breakfast, now the summons is there. He's being summoned to conference. He called Don Rawlinson outside and he said, Don, you know, they've summoned me to leadership meeting. And he said, where do you stand in this? And Don Rawlinson said, if you're not in right relationship with your pastor, you have no right to pastor here and you should resign. And he said, how do I view it? I view it, Pastor Mitchell is a general. You're maybe a colonel. What you should do, you should go to America and sort this out and do what Pastor Mitchell says. That was not the answer he wanted. But that was what he told him. This, this man was an emotional manipulator. He would use sympathy as a weapon uh, to manipulate people to his will. Daryl reminded me of this. He said at some point we were discussing this uh, when there was a conflict. Apparently I told Daryl, I said, I predict this Sunday he will cry in church. And Daryl then thought well, I was a prophet because sure enough, that Sunday he was talking about Saul persecuting David and he began to cry. And be that was how he operated. So when Don Rawlinson said, no, you need, to, you need to sort this out, he called a uh, council meeting. He had a three-man council. One was Don Rawlinson, who now is clearly seeing what he's about is not into him. He had a, uh, another man that was a good man but had no strong opinions either way. And he had a third man who actually was a great fan of his. So he called a council meeting and he pulled on them emotionally, told them how difficult it's been. He's under such stress and uh, uh, pressure. The point of him telling that was so they would say, you poor man, we need you, we're behind you. He was telling them that so they would view Pastor Bishop in a bad light. But in actual fact, Don Rawlinson brought out a resignation letter and said, if you're not going to sort this out, you need to resign. The other man who had no strong opinion agreed, I think you should resign. And the man who was a fan totally misread the emotional manipulation because he was saying, it's so difficult, it's so hard to go on. The man said, you really do need a break, you should resign. <laughs> the man freaked out, he stepped outside, I gotta call my wife, got on the phone, stepped back out and he said, I have to go home, my wife's fainted. I don't believe for a second that she fainted, but that was, the moment he left, he obviously called some people and the council started getting calls from men attacking them, how dare you do that? But in actual fact, what it did, even the man who was a fan, it firmed their resolve and they said, no, this is the right thing. He needs to resign. And this is powerful, and the man did it. He signed the letter, and he resigned. Let's go back. I want you to look at this. Dad faxed me this. Dad sent me a fax with a, a photocopy from his Bible with that page. He said, Greg, can you believe it? Paul Stevens said, within six months, I prayed and said, Lord, this year, and he said, God did it. He resigned. We have resolved that problem. The council asked Pastor Mitchell to come and take the church. Dad told me privately, he said, I don't think I can. He, he's thinking about the money and, uh, you know, you, these days you got to send it electronically. He said, Greg, how will I send them? How can I take the church? I can't even send support. And there was a man who would be like Sharon Allen does in our church, the, the treasurer, named Charles Spadaro, and I said, Charles will help you. I didn't even know if Charles was going to stay in the church, but I said, Charles is going to help you. And he did. He was a blessing. This man, uh, Harold Warner, flew to the church when he resigned. He flew in, uh, spent, uh, I think, under a week there, met with this man. The man swore, I am not going to start a church. But remember, rebels lie. When he is swearing to Harold that he's not going to start another church, 
he already had made the booking at the Morley Recreation Center to start his new church. <laughs> lie, 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 but he did. He started in February, it was by the plan of God, the hall was not available. It gave Pastor Mitchell a few weeks grace to come in, take the church. A few weeks later, he did open a church. He took about 175 people and I'm sure much to his surprise, you know, he had boasted to Pastor Mitchell, all of the Australian pastors, all of the churches in the UK, they're all with me. They're all behind me. Much to his surprise, when he left, he took uh, a, a grand total in Australia and in England of about six churches. That was all he got. Most of those were very tiny pioneer uh, uh, churches. And so my parents spent six months, they were only there on a visitor's visa, took, uh, spent six months pastoring the church. I want you to see the next picture from Dad's Bible. And uh, the, here it is, strengthen, O oh God, that which you've wrought for us. He wrote this on January 4, 2009. He's going to leave next week, essentially, for Australia. That is what his prayer was. Oh God, strengthen that which you have uh, wrought uh, there. And then I think there's one more photo here. At the top, uh, this where God gave Solomon wisdom and largeness of heart and down below, this is my father's heart, not human or natural ability, but a gift and gracing to help God's people. And he wrote that February 27 of 2009. Dad went in, he, he told one of the men who was an assistant, he said, find me a furnished house. Remember, Mr. I'm practically a millionaire. He found him a furnished house in an area called Lockridge. Lockridge is a welfare housing area, or it was back then. This was brilliant. Is what a contrast. People are like, where are you, where are you living, Pastor Mitchell? In Lockridge? They're like, <laughs> Lockridge? But it was great. He spent six months there in a, in a humble, uh, furnished apartment, and God did an absolute miracle. Supernaturally restored the spirit of the church in evangelism. Got some photos from Dad's six months there. Heaven's gates and hell's flames. He doesn't know where everybody stands, so he pulled the altar call himself. There's a revival during that time with Jerry Fussell. He had a very powerful one with Roman uh, Gutierrez at the same week that uh, this man was opening his rebel church. And, uh, but he supernaturally res restored the spirit of discipleship. When Lisa and I went, men, women, children, dogs and cats, everybody, chickens wanted to preach the gospel. I mean, it was the spirit but that was gone. But when Pastor Mitchell came, he restored it. We have some photos. This is a men's discipleship class that he had. And then the next one, he went every morning after prayer. Next photo, this is at McDonald's. They call this Macca's Cathedral or Holy Macca's. <laughs> he went and he met with men every day. Now they're not talking about investment and money. They're talking about God's will and the Bible, and doing the will of God, and you see there two members of my family, there's a Steve Zapata, his son Michael, uh, they, they got back on track, and uh, are preaching the gospel today, we're very, very grateful uh, for that, in six months, my father did what would take anybody else years and years to do, because of his grace, his uh, uh, level of respect, but a miracle of God. He prepared the way after six months, turned the church over to Tom and Janice Payne. And uh, here's Tom and Janice. They went and they rebuilt the foundations. Tom and Janice spent 12 years rebuilding foundations, outreach and evangelism. Here's outreaches. There's Tom and Janice uh, on outreach. You see them. Uh, next photo, park outreaches. Tom began... They never did park outreaches. That, the opinion of this man, he said, they don't work. Well, apparently they do. And so park outreaches, they did park outreaches. Summertime, glorious time of uh, labor there. The pain spent 12 years in Perth. In 12 years, they wound up restoring the spirit of discipleship, church planting. In their 12 years, they planted 33 couples out into ministry. Thank God. 
And you see here on the screen, you see that is what began to be restored was church planting. And that is what God did, a miracle. Uh, in 2021, Tom and Janice Payne, they turned the work in Perth and the leadership over to Daryl and Jillian Elliott. Here are the Elliots. There is their changeover service. The, Tom Payne is laying hands on them. Uh, this is, uh, that's the Elliots, Daryl and Jillian. Here he's preaching in conference. There is me praying for them in a, uh, uh, a Aussie conference. Subsequently, I want to tell you the work of God continues. It is a miracle what God has done. As you know, October, I went there. Uh, it, it was on the, to the day, 45 years to the day that Ron and Susie Burrow pioneered and opened up in Perth, West Australia, we have here uh, that couple in the, in the middle, uh, Russell and Sue Plummer, they were saved, came in under Ron Burl, are still there, a blessing to this day. There's Daryl and Jillian, Lisa and I, and we're about to cut the 45th anniversary cake. I wanna tell you, the work of God has gone on. God is in charge of his work. Can you say amen? Thank God for his goodness, praise God. Let's talk then about succession. I told you about preparation for succession. Let's talk about succession. Here's how smart God is. A rebel makes plans to damage the work of God. God actually used the plans of a rebel to accelerate the plan of succession. So dad has to leave Prescott for six months. While dad was gone, I took over all aspects of pastoring, and decision-making in the Prescott Church. So this actually helped us because people saw the church, in fact, didn't fall apart when Pastor Mitchell wasn't here. That's, that's a good message to know, that things don't fall apart. In a wider sense, what happened with pastors? Pastors would normally have in their di very difficult um, problems in the church that they're not sure what to do, they would call Pastor Mitchell, but now he's away and there's a 15 hour time difference. Some of them had crisis, they needed to know what to do right now. You can wait 15 hours or 10 hours or however many hours until you can speak to Pastor Mitchell. But what it did is some of them wound up calling me and I was able to give advice and then they saw if they took my advice and it worked out well, that actually really, really helped but that came about because the rebel was uh, trying to destroy. Dad made a comment, I think we'll have it on the screen. He said this over and over again. He would tell people, when I left for Australia, I handed the reins to Greg and I never took them back. When he came back to Prescott, he did not take back over all of the aspects and church planting and uh, many, many of the things. I was able, Lisa and I were able to make my father's final years of ministry enjoyable. By me taking all of the responsibility, we were able to uh, allow dad to travel and preach without pressure and without responsibility. When people would call and there were problems, he said, talk to Greg. If they wanted counsel, he said, talk to Greg. If there were decisions to be made, talk to Greg. He pushed it off on me. That was, it helped him but it was also for my development and it was also uh, to send a message to other people. In leadership, he did a seminar on succession and was clearly asked by someone, have you got a plan for a successor? And he said, yes, and let it be known, Greg is my chosen successor. My mother passed away in 2016 and uh, we were then able to help dad through the next phase of life, uh, Lisa and I, I came up with a plan. We had been uh, meeting in a tent for many years for conference. I came up with a plan for building a building that would house conference, but I came up with a way that we could use it in regular time as well. Dad gave his backing to it and we built this building here. The angels are singing right there, come on. God bless you, Randy. Randy Wowen gave me that photo. That is a fantastic photo. 
I like that right there. That's a, a favorite of mine. Uh, and so we built this building. We began meeting uh, in this uh, in, what, 2019, I think. Dad preached a sermon. And uh, somewhere along the line, I think it was just before the building was done here. In the sermon, he told a story of history when General George Patton asked his mentor, General John Pershing, to bless him. He was entering into a very large role, and he came to General Pershing, and he said, would you bless me? And he had him kneel down, laid hands on him, and blessed him. When Dad said that, I said, that's what I need. One morning after breakfast, I asked Dad, took him in the office. I said, I need that. Would you pray for me? And bless me. I want, you're imparting your spirit by words and actions and example, but I want you to pray deliberately. He did that, laid hands on me. That was private. There was no one around to uh, see that because I need the spirit of God and I need my father's spirit as well. Around about this time, another rebel, there are always rebels, another rebel in New Zealand was mouthing. This is a common line that rebels were using. The fellowship will fall apart when Pastor Mitchell dies. When Dad heard that, it ticked him off. So he preached a sermon, knowing this is how people think. He preached a sermon, maybe some of you remember it. It's on YouTube somewhere. And that sermon is called, When Pastor Mitchell is Gone. And at the end of the sermon, he publicly laid hands on Lisa and I. We have a photo. Uh, of this. This is what he's doing. He was now letting the world know of his choice, and uh, that was partly so people would know, but he was publicly imparting his spirit upon Lisa and I. Dad preached his last sermon in April of 2020. He was having problems that we knew, didn't know what was wrong. Uh, in the, near the end of his sermon, any of you that were here, you know, he was having many strokes as a result of uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. Preached his last sermon in April of 2020, never preached again, and then we guided him through uh, um, John and Aaron Maiola moved in with him, God bless them. They helped Stephen and Emily Cassio and Jesse and Beth Morales. We all banded together uh, by the grace of God. We were able to let him live out his final days at home if we would have put him in a care home, we would have never seen him again because of COVID. And so thank God we were able to, to his dying breath, we were able to be with dad and uh, helped. Dad had, when mom died, dad bought a headstone, but it was not carved yet. And uh, he left it up to me. When I die, you put whatever you want to put on it. How do you sum up my dad's life, my parents' life, but this is what I chose and put on there. This is my parents' gravestone, and Mitchell, and I simply put, they bless the world. And that's what I have told, yes, amen. And in all the memorial stones, we thank God. My father heard from God, lived a life of integrity, and handed off a great blessing to us. Now, because my father is gone, I am... Wherever I go, I'm introduced as the leader of the fellowship. And I do think that people who don't understand probably have a wrong idea what that means. They, they are assuming being the leader of the fellowship is a position of power. I think people have the idea that being a leader is I have banks of phones I'm answering. Like, yes, no, off with their head because this is a power position, but that's not. Listen, I'll put it on the screen. Being a leader is not a position of power. It's a place of service. What does it mean when you say Greg Mitchell is the leader of the fellowship? That means that my job and my privilege is I get to serve the fellowship. I get to serve the churches in the fellowship. What is my role as leader of the fellowship? My job is to maintain the course. I'm telling you where we came from my job is to make sure we never leave the memorial stones. There will never come a time where you're going to say, yeah, we, used to do, we don't do that anymore. No, my job is to hold to what was handed to it. My job is to impart a spirit. You know that I travel extensively. What I'm doing, partly I preach to impart a spirit, but everywhere I go, Lisa hates going. She won't travel with me because she says, you're up at six in the morning meeting with people to answer questions. That is what I do. I answer questions. I give people access to me so that they can ask anything they want, so that they get 
clear sense of our fellowship. My job is imparting reference points. I give reference points through teaching. And uh, my Sunday schools are used all over the world and, and I'm able to bless. I'm able to provide advice and to counsel on difficult situations. I'm able to direct financial resources to God's purposes. My job is to foresee dangers and uh, deal with uh, uh, doctrinal dangers, sidetracks. I do not want us to get sidetracked. My job is to see it. Uh, it's, it's dangerous for us. We're not going to go down that road, avoid them, deal with them. My job is to direct other leaders to, to deal with regional conflicts. Sometimes I have to personally get involved in conflicts. But overall, I'm telling you what my role is because any of you here, any of you that are watching online, please, I covet your prayers. That is what I want more than any. Thing else. If you ever want to bless us at Christmas, pray for us. That's what I need. Pray that God gives me wisdom. Pray that God gives me a spirit that is like my father's that I can hold the course until Jesus comes. And, and uh, that is my job. Let's look final thought before we close. Let's talk about moving into the future. God has done an incredible work so far. As of uh, as of today, this is December of 2023, uh, from the top of my head, uh, we have 3,628 churches today. An incredible work that God has done, but the job is not finished yet. Our job is not, thank God we got all those churches. Joshua 13, 1. Someone read that out. There remains very much land yet to be possessed. Okay. That's how I feel. We have 3,628 churches. Yes, wonderful. But there remains much land to be possessed. They'll put this graphic on the screen. Right now, there are 235 recognized nations in the world. That's according to the United Nations there. We currently have churches in 139 nations. This is December 2023. But what that means is that there are 96 nations in the world where we do not have a single fellowship church. They have a, just a graphic just to show you this, uh, a little video graphic, and this will show you where many of these are located. There is the world, and you will see here are the bulk of the nations where there are no fellowship church. Most of the places, and here's the list of uh, nations where we do not have many, many of those nations, we don't have a fellowship church in our Muslim nations. And we need God to help us to reach Muslim nations. We need strategies. We need open doors. We need the correct people. Probably not everyone would work in a Muslim nation, but God has people. He will speak. He will help us in this uh, uh, to reach the entire world. That we're not going to rest until we reach the entire world. There remains very much land to be possessed. People ask me, what are you seeing in the future? I know many of you, you're already freaked out about the election. That is not what I'm looking at. What I'm, what's going to happen in the future? I am believing God for last day's revival. That's what I'm believing. Who knows what's going to happen in the election? That's irrelevant. The point is, I believe God is going to give us a last day's revival. Read this verse, Amos 9, 13. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him who sows seed. The mountain shall drip with sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. Okay, that is describing an end times revival, the plowman overtaking the reaper. What that means is there is such a massive harvest at the time it's time to uh, uh, start plowing for the next, you're still pulling in. It's describing a massive harvest and the harvest we want is souls. I believe that God is going to give us a worldwide revival. Our job in our fellowship, I don't know what other churches in the world are doing. I don't actually care. I know what we do. Our job is to plant churches in every nation of the world so that we can be facilitators of revival, but more than that, so we can retain revival. We know what to do with converts. 
And when God gives us a massive amount, that's what I am doing. Final thought, how can we stay on track over time? If you know the history of revival, you know that revivals don't last. And usually churches and movements that start in revival today are nothing like they used to be. They've gotten off track. I don't want that to happen. I don't want all we have to say, did we ever tell you what God did in 1970 and then it all went to hell? That's not what I want. I want to stay on track. How do we stay on track? Partly by what we've done. I've given you the memorial stones. These form patterns. I say people all over the world, they are watching this because there are people that did not have the privilege of being in the Prescott Church or being in 1970 or the early days when we planted churches. They don't understand where some of the things we do. So I've given memorial stones. Exodus 25, 40. And see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. Okay, we have a pattern. What does God bless when you build according to pattern? That's why I do not understand. Be, do you get what people are doing uh, in, you know, in Asbury? In, I don't care. Do you know what the Lord is doing? In don't care. That, that's not of it. We have a pattern. I don't care what other churches in the world are doing because I'm not a part of those churches. God has given us a pattern. It works fantastically well. Our job is to keep doing what God has given us. So I encourage pastors, anybody that's watching, you're watching online, you're a pastor, you're showing this in your church or watching it, I encourage you, ask questions. I, I haven't given, of course, everything we do in the fellowship. We'd, st we'd be here for another five years. But uh, I'm, I'm encouraging, ask questions. Anything we do has a reason. Ask you can ask me. You can ask other leaders. Understand it for yourself. I encourage every pastor, preserve your history in your local church. One of the difficulties in, in, for me in this lesson, I have spent more time tracking down photos than I did actually on the lessons. And part of that is we have people, we're so busy working, we don't realize when there are photos and flyers and Trumpet, we don't realize someday we may want to look back at those. So I encourage pastors, preserve history. Part of that is we have people that they had great photos, but they backslid. They've left and joined the Church of the Chosen Frozen, and then we can't get them. Hold on to those, because you may need them someday. But apart from that, every pastor, I encourage you, Memorial Stones is not just something that I give from Prescott. Every one of you should be doing that. You should tell your part. I've told you along the line, I've woven in me and Lisa because it's my part in the moment. I have a part in it. You can do that. Every pastor, you should do that. You should tell your congregation and the churches under you, how did you get here? And then where does your church fit in the memorial stones? Final thought here is they can put just on the screen. This is a, a very lengthy. These are all of the lessons that we have looked at through this is the 30th lesson. I have given you all of these, and I think there are several pages of them, and these are not, of course, all of the lessons. My point is there are memorial stones, and we're going to hold. It. How about you? How many of you want to keep doing what God told us to do until Jesus comes back? Let's praise God. Let's thank God for all that he's done. God, we are grateful grateful for the privilege of being a part of your great work. Oh God, help us to stay on track. And God, every person that is watching this online and every church, God, I am asking that you will grace them and cause there to be a spirit that is imparted all over the world. We want to stay on track and we'll do that by memorial stones. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. And the service will start, amen. Thank God.